I am super excited about this topic. Um, I came in um, really sort of chewing on the topic of how did groups make decisions. And over the about two or three years, I, I was convinced by the people around me that really the hardest part of this, the only real part of it is how groups under, do that sense making. How do they develop a shared understanding of what the problem space is? Um, and that's where everybody really gets stuck. Um, so I'm thrilled to have three folks here. I'm gonna let them introduce themselves. Um, start with that, um, dig a little bit into sort of the definition. What do we mean by this word sense making? Um, stories and such. I will try, I think we're gonna try to keep a little bit of time for Q and A and um, then Rosso and I will moderate the questions in the in the chat. So folks should feel free to go ahead and use the, the Zoom chat. Okay, um, so for introductions, let me start with um, Caitlin and then Dave and then Antoine, and then we'll go into our various versions of the definitions. So Caitlin, go ahead. Sure. Uh, well, first of all, good morning from California. Um, I'm having some problems with my headphones today, so I hope you can hear me okay. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, it's great to be here. Um, again, my name is Caitlin, and my professional title is that I'm the head of protocol governance at the Filecoin Foundation. Um, so Filecoin is a layer one protocol dedicated to providing decentralized data storage for the decentralized web. Um, and I've been in this position for about four years now, so it's been quite a while in the Web3 space. Um, prior to this, I had different experiences working in tech, um, but almost exclusively in the public sector or with nonprofits. Um, so my background is as a political scientist and as a researcher, um, and my interests over time have always been related to um, systems of open governance, um, democratic innovation, um, and complex sort of interdisciplinary policy spaces. So those are sort of the experiences and, and interests that I have brought into this space, um, where I often find myself as sort of the only social scientist uh, working with hundreds and hundreds of engineers. So sense-making is a very common challenge for us. Uh, Dave Snowden, um, I started oh, many, many years ago, and my back, academic background is a mixture of philosophy, physics, and anthropology. Um, and you'll see that come through in some of the things I'll talk about. Um, I designed and built decision support systems back in the early days of computing before moving into corporate strategy roles. And then IBM acquired the company and I went into research functions. I designed and built sense-making systems under DARPA programs before and after 9-11, um, focusing on weak signal detection in counterterrorism, and then risk assessment, horizon scanning for the Singapore government and set up the company Cognitive Edge, which then became the Kinevin company to take those ideas forward. So we're an action research group, yeah. Um, we focus on the application of natural science to human systems, and I'll talk a bit more about that later. Fantastic, and Antoine, yes. Yeah, hello everyone, happy to be here. Uh, my name is Antoine, I work at Mission Public. Mission Public is a team of uh, 15 to 20. We are based in Europe and we work mostly on citizens assemblies, uh, meaning the combination of randomly selected citizens plus a topic of public policy to give recommendation to decision makers. And we've been doing that since over 25 years now. So it's a long, long way. Uh, I've been in that adventure since 2011. Uh, before that, I, I've been um, writing my PhD on random selection in politics. So it's kind of my uh, fixed idea to work on that. Um, and um, I am also interested in the Web3 decentralized governance topic since 2017 when I discovered the world computer and the Internet of Chains. And uh, since then, I am trying to bridge those um, worlds because I think that both uh, have something to bring to governance in the future. And I think that we, on the same time, have the risk uh, for Web3 governance to fall in the exact trap that uh, other governance systems have um, found with uh, elections, representative democracy, and what we see now in those spaces. So I think I hope that we can leverage the and leapfrog governance and uh, that we can f be a fruitful collaboration between both of them. Awesome. I love this panel. This is great. <clears throat> so I want us to start out taking this very jargon e word of sense making. Um, and so talk a bit mm -hmm. about the definition. So um, Dave, can you start us off? You've got this sort of very 
long and established deep background in this space. Um, you've probably given some definition to it. What do people actually mean when they say sense making? Probably the first fight is whether you put a hyphen into it or not. Um, mm -hmm. And that actually matters because it's a difference between the noun and the verb. And um, if you look at literature, and that's an academic reference, it talks about five different schools of sense making. Uh, the granddaddy of them all is Carl Weick. Um, and that approach takes a sort of American sociological tradition of observing behavior and deriving generalized rules from that. Uh, you then get Gary Klein, who's a good friend, who was the first person to look at the way people make decision making through pattern recognition, not through structured analysis. Um, he's in DC. Um, Brenda Derving, who tragically died last year, who was postmodernist librarian science narrative. Uh, she and I worked a lot together. And there's a whole group of people in IT, um, Russell and Natal, which really focus into the use of IT to make sense of the world. And then you've got my school, which is called Naturalizing Sense Making. So I use it with a hyphen um, because I want it to be a verb, and that matters. And I define sense making as how can you make sense of the world so that you can act in it? And with that comes a concept of sufficiency. You never know all you need to know to make a rational decision but you need to know what types of decision you can make based on what you do know or can know within the time horizon for decision-making. So that's what sense-making means. Naturalizing means to root what you do in the natural sciences. Sorry, I come from a physics background. We always used to joke that social scientists suffer from physics envy, and it was a deliberate play on words um, because they never have enough data to form any valid conclusion. Um, so we, we don't take a case-based approach on this. What we actually do is you take things like inattentional blindness, give you is a good example of it. Um, if you give radiologists a batch of x-rays, they'll ask them, ask them to look for anomalies. On the final x-ray, you put a picture of a gorilla, which is 48 times the size of a cancer nodule. 83% of radiologists will not see it, even though their eyes physically scan it. And the 17% who do see it come to believe they were wrong when they talk with the 83% who didn't. So the minute you recognize that as a scientific fact, which it is, it invalidates about 90% of decision support methods in companies. Yeah, you, you do not expect what you do not expect to see. So we start with that natural science base and say that gives us a substrate or a set of constraints. And then we develop methods and tools consistent with that. Oh, fantastic. Caitlin, tell us a bit about how you define an operationalize or how, how, when you're talking to your engineers that you're surrounded by, how do you define sense making? Yeah, I, I think this um, for us ends up operationalizing primarily as a design question. Um, and it is oftentimes localized to very specific problem spaces um, insofar as we can define them. So working within an organization like I do, which is diffuse, decentralized, um, has participants of various cultural and linguistic backgrounds, um, a lot of folks who have a very sort of technical orientation professionally, but even within that, there's a ton of diversity um, in the experience they're bringing to the table. Um, like Dave said, there's always quite a bit of information that you do not have when trying to make decisions in these environments. Um, trying to orient around a single problem and agreeing on potential and appropriate solutions for uh, solution pathways. Um, there tend to be three big stumbling blocks that we need to break down before we can get to a place where we are aligned enough to be actionable. Um, these tend to be uh, cultural assumptions, right? Almost all of them hidden. People don't understand what it is um, that they are assuming when they go into these types of conversations or have these big naughty problems they're trying to undo. Um, there are operational motivations. Um, folks may agree that they have the same vision or they're all trying to do the same technical thing. Um, but as you really get into the weeds of that, you can find out that there are a lot of different operational trajectories that people may have already planned on and not disclosed. There are a lot of hidden biases that we constantly unravel. Um, and the third one is diffusion of responsibility. When you're asking people to come together and contribute to sense making or very um, literally try and prob uh, problem solve a specific solution space, um, needing to understand who is going to be empowered to actually push forward ideas um, to facilitate these conversations and to get everyone into that alignment, to do that sort of diffused cat herding. Um, these things are really challenging. And I think those are the three buckets that we tend to find sense making um, a really valuable operational framework 
um, for actually moving through and being productive rather than just having a bunch of voices in a room, but an inability to really move in any one direction collectively. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. being aware being aware of the gorillas that you're not seeing what's what are the biases that go in and what makes it hard to understand and agree excellent Antoine yes so I, <laughs> I will take a definition based on an instrument so what I was saying before so I think indeed um so deliberative citizens deliberative processes um are a tool for sense making and I will go from there. Um, so what I experience um, is that in that process, you, you connect three very important pieces of um, human collaboration and human decision-making. The first one is the co cognitive diversity because you randomly select people. So you have that higher chance of having uh, higher knowledge and diversity in uh, the group. So that's what we know from the wisdom of crowds um, kind of uh, philosophy um, that you have the cognitive diversity. And secondly, you have a procedural fairness um, because you have a structured and facilitated discussion of exchanging arguments. And um, down the line, if you uh, go back to theory, you, you approach something like Habermas and the force of the better argument. So you try to um, state against uh, power structures uh, and uh, things that are not said, as we're seeing Kathleen and Dave. Uh, so there is a procedural strength uh, to it that allow uh, and supports sense-making. And the third one is uh, what you see is that um, it responds to our biology <laughs> and our uh, nature of uh, social species. Because indeed, if you put people in a room and if you uh, let them discuss, they start producing hormones like oxytocin. Uh, so we know it's the hormone of uh, exclusion uh, without, but it's also the hormone of uh, happiness within. And, and so that's what happens. So we have a a deeply entrenched and biological um, uh, wish uh, to coordinate with other human, uh, which is uh, also now more and more um, being found in, in archaeology, uh, why uh, Homo sapiens sapiens had that strength. And I think those um, those processes of deliberation with random selection and uh, structured discussion uh, tap into uh, those, those three pillars that allow to have a, a sense-making process. Uh, and um, yeah, so I would stop here, but that would be the way I would approach it. Love those definitions. And they all sort of get at different angles of this space, sort of the fundamental of, of that action of doing the sense making, like assessing it at looking for what you know, what you don't know, getting to the agreement about what you don't know and don't know. Um, I'd love to get some stories. And I'm really interested in the stories of um, times when groups surprise themselves right when they go through this this behavior of of understanding this problem space and learn something that they didn't know learn bef know before and understand something that they didn't know before um who has a story that they'd like to share who wants to hop in with something at the tip of their tongue I mean I can jump in with some of the work where yeah. you said is an engagement because that, that makes sense and I mean, there's some agreements and disagreements with Anton here. I don't think you should define a system in terms of your ideologically biased preferred solution. Just to mm -hmm. be, um, yeah. Um, I mean, we know that people evolve to make decisions in groups, but they make decisions radically different in groups of two, five, twenty, fifty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and actually, once you go above that, they naturally evolve to conflict. So it's not necessarily to get agreement. So I think there are significant issues. Yeah. Um, we've been working in two areas and we're active in two of them. One is using school children as ethnographers to their own environment. We've done that now in Sweden. We've done it in the UK. We've done it in Colombia. And the concept here is to get young people at 16 to go into their community and to gather stories as part of the school, school curriculum. And the thing we developed and developed and refined under DARPA funding was what's called high abstraction metadata. So the children interpret their own stories. And to me, this is absolutely vital. It's called epistemic justice in the literature. Yeah, power lies in interpretation. Yeah, and in the power to interpret without being facilitated through the process. Yeah, it's the, it's that, that to us is important. So that gets us quantitative data at scale. So we did one in the South Wales Valleys. We had young children. They went out, they gathered stories about urban deprivation. You know, there are streets in Ferndale, which no family has seen employment in three generations. 
yeah, with all the consequences which come from that. And then once we could get the narrative patterns from that, so we're now showing narrative as a landscape pattern, yeah, not as a set of choices, but as a pattern of beliefs and attitudes. A minister was able to say, if I could have more stories like this and fewer stories like those, then I would fund it. And that, by the way, is a whole new theory of change. You don't talk about outcome. You say more of these, fewer of those, which is a form of micro nudge. And then we put transgenerational pairs, so young kids together with their grandparents, and there's a science behind that, it's linked to brain plasticity, uh, together with somebody from local government. And if they generated an idea, they could run it. And one of the best ones was a bike, bike run, which was erected over the old slag heaps of the mine works, which was built for free by the fire service because they wanted fire spotters and the kids loved being fire spotters. And it was a great program, but when we back and check, the cup pub car park where it started was where the drug dealers met and the community knew that but they couldn't tackle it directly so we ended up with 50 or 60 micro programs like that generated bottom up but directed top down in terms of direction rather than the grand government plan that if we just do this thing in five years time everything will be perfect and that for me epitomizes what we're trying to do in terms of distributed sense making and really focusing on technology as an enabler, but not as a determinant yeah, of the human interactions and, and activity. Fascinating. The, in the, you mentioned that when we've been talking, dancing around, or I've been sort of noticing this, this issue of like gathering the data, the going out, gathering the data, pulling it together. And then there's the, I want more of this and more of that. Um, the and you're saying it's you're trying to remove the facilitation from the process yeah. but still make sure that that it always happens um what do you let me leave it at that i'm going to come back around maybe um after we have some more more stories because we're collecting stories um and ask about that transition of how, how you know from going to data to to sort of sharing and narrowing um who is an, another story antoine actually can i Yes, of course. It's so I mean, the, that's yeah. the, the 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 impressive thing is that so we we try to evaluate um, what the participants um, think at the beginning of the end uh, of such a process, and we um, as far as we can try to also monitor what they do after a, a process of deliberation. What we know is that is that ninety percent of participants. Um, declare that they have changed their opinion and that they will change their behavior uh, after wh whatever the process. Uh, so in the, completely independently from the topic. Uh, and that's interesting. Um, but then you go into a concrete. For example, when you do a, a process on climate, and I can testify one of them with 25 participants, and I had one who sold uh, three from its car. He had three car, uh, four cars. He sold three of them and started to bike. So there was a kind of uh, realization on his side. The next one put solar panels on his, uh, on his uh, house, and you can add up the, the stories. And you have always, when you have a group of 100 to 150, you have always 5 to 10 that become active in politics and that start being uh, elected. Uh, or, uh, for example, in the French Citizens Assembly on Climate, uh, you had three that became uh, mayor of uh, their uh, hometown after having participated. So that's a kind of a transformative experience for people. And, and we know that not only from the what they say, but also from what they do after. Um, so that's and another, the latest story, maybe, um, we did a panel on a, a recommendation anti-hatred uh, in society at the European level. So we had 150 citizens in that group, randomly selected, um, and I was facilitating one of the groups. And in that group, I had three people from the 12. So we had five languages, uh, people from uh, five different countries in Europe talking with another uh, on what to do against hatred. And we had three of those people that were clearly racist. And at the beginning of the process, were um, uh, putting racist uh, position sentences into the room. Uh, and then they, but then they discussed and they evolved. And what is interesting is that they hadn't completely changed their mindset, but what had happened is the ways they, had, they articulated their recommendations and what we need to do as a society was completely different. So for one, for example, he 
he started with saying, okay, we need less uh, immigration in Europe. Then he said, oh, that's interesting. What I want is for all kids uh, to have um, um, school uh, uh, mandatory from three and language uh, school to learn the, the language of the country. And in the third session and the last one, he had added to that and, and he was discussing and proposing to add um, um, in the in mandatory, not mandatory, but um, um, in option in the schools to have a course on non-violent communication for kids, plus the language and mandatory from three. So that was the package he was proposing at the end to reduce anti hatred So, and I think that's interesting because it's it's really for him it was a, a process um, of change actually. Fascinating, Caitlin. Tell us a story in Filecoin. Yeah, well, from wherever. Sure. Um, so I think our approaches, um, or the thing that's really jumping out for me, is is what happens a little bit more down the line once you have tried or come up with some preliminary conclusions that you think make sense, and how do you manage the communication and diffusion of those learnings? Um, so one thing in particular about two years ago. Um, one of the things that I've been really interested in, not just in Filecoin, but in a lot of other protocol environments or open source organizations, how do you see political units or factions begin to form and how do they operate within the system? Um, so within Filecoin's ecosystem, Filecoin is still, um, I still consider it very much a group of concept. Um, it's community members, the folks who are here and are beginning to participate in governing activities or any kind of, of collective effort to drive forward the work that we're trying to do. Um, these groups are still very uh, changeable. And about two years ago, we began to identify this group of people who were consolidating. They were putting together working groups. They were showing up together in person at different events. Um, and they all sort of had a couple of things in common. They were all coming from a general geographic locality. Um, so they spoke different languages, but they were all coming generally from Asia. Um, they were increasingly interested in very particular proposal types, um, specifically related to the way crypto economics were being um, developed within this ecosystem, different proposals that were being put forth to change the way this ecosystem um, determines crypto economic policy, et cetera. Um, but we couldn't figure out why exactly this group was forming and what sort of the driving motivation was. And there was this assumption that, um, you know, these people have sort of simple economic motivations and that's sort of what's binding them together. Um, so we actually ran a series of interviews over the course of a year and a half. Um, we ended up partnering with a couple of other academic organizations and going to Australia for this research colloquium. Um, there were a bunch of different methods involved to really try and understand how this group of people was organizing themselves and why. Um, and what we realized is that all of these assumptions that, you know, different organizational leaders or different community members um, we're kind of leaning on that, you know, this group is interested in economic policy because they have economic motivations. Um, this may have been a small piece of the story, but the reality is that this group of people actually had a cultural orientation that was totally misunderstood within the broader diffuse organization, right? Um, when they used terms like Web3 or decentralized, uh, whether they were using them um, in their native languages or translated into English, they had an entirely different definition of these terms, um, both conceptually and operationally, um, than most, um, especially American-based contributors had. Um, their understanding of even governance as a functional area or as a concept uh, was radically different uh, than it was when I used the term or when my colleagues used the term. And we found out that the actual difference is that they had constructed this sort of organizational narrative that didn't match one that we had visibility into at all. Um, so the challenge for us, I mean, it was so surprising to learn this and there was a lot of depth there. It ended up taking us quite a bit to understand how some of these concepts were fitting together for this group of people. Um, but once we got there, the problem became, how do we actually make this understanding more broadly recognized? How do we get other people who have developed influence or are really involved in like issues within this community of people? How do we get them to understand this perspective? And how do we get to a place where we have a common enough perspective to approach complex policy topics and governing issues um, in the same way? Um, and there, there's a lot of sort of very subjective um, more philosophical complexity there because you are trying to ascertain who has more of a correct position with which to go forth from. 
Um, but it's challenging. And what we found is that a lot of different folks were actually very resistant to this idea because the idea that seemed the most obvious to them felt the most comfortable and it was therefore the one they wanted to act upon in trying to get these people to um, participate in a way that they found um, interpretable. So the communication challenge, um, it, it's still a challenge for us. We, we have certainly not solved it. Yeah. The, how do you find yourself spotting a need for sense-making? Um, Kate, and I'd like to start with you. I think you you just started one with one story. You know, you're seeing organization, you're seeing different groups forming and 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 hardening attitudes. I think that's one. I'd love to start with with a very concrete story, and then um, Antoine and Dave. You guys tend to be a little bit more on the outside of organizations. When do organizations come to you saying we have this need? Um, so for me, sort of the, the recognition comes when we have, um, a lack of traction on important issues. Um, when there is something that people agree is a problem or an interest or an opportunity, mm -hmm. and there is no ability to make progress on towards that thing. Um, the other one is an increase in conflict over things that should be relatively, um, uh, non-controversial or less complex, right? So things that you see, oh, there's sort of an objectivity to this. This seems like a value add, it's low cost. Why is it that people who are very motivated and well positioned to design or implement or execute, why is it that they themselves are not able to do so or are doing so in conflict with others that should be in alignment with them? Um, there is another um, ecosystem that I've, I've been involved in and done a lot of work in and one area where we saw this all the time was there was a program that had been designed, like a grants program, effectively, um, to support developers who are coming into the community. And the structure of this grants program is very convoluted. It was very complicated. Um, there was a ton of oversight for a very low level amount of investment that was being made. Um, and people who were developing good work and had been recipients of grants um, found that there was so much overhead and reporting and monitoring required to access this money um, that they just didn't have the resources as like a small team of developers to make it worth their while. So we obviously needed to reform the way this was working. Um, everyone seemed in agreement that this was the case. And it took about a year and a half before a single programmatic suggestion was really made um, that would move a grants program, something that, you know, we have millions and millions of examples and best practices of in terms of running. It is it is a program that can be run that is not really specifically bound to any of the cultural tenets of decentralized organizations. There's lots of ways we know how to do this. It took us about a year and a half to actually make any progress on fixing this really top heavy and cumbersome program that no one enjoyed either working within, receiving money from, or facilitating. Um, and what we found as we, we dug into it is there was this fundamental misunderstanding people had um, about how much demand existed for these grants. Um, and a lot of folks who are responsible for facilitating this program, what they found out is that they assumed that if they changed the rules or lessened them in any way, that there would be so many people that were applying or requesting funds, that they would be overwhelmed and that this situation would be ripe for exploitation. And what we found out is that because of how cumbersome this program had become, there actually is no one interested at all in participating or applying because it's, it's again, there's the value equation for them just isn't right. And we had assumed for a long time that this was really obvious. You know, part of the problem is this compounding effect of no demand for the thing we have a supply of. Yeah. And we found that key people who were, who were involved in this had totally oppositional perspectives. It wasn't just small little misalignments and misunderstandings. It was a fundamental misinterpretation between two groups of people um, that didn't know that they were pulling in opposite directions while trying to solve a single agreed upon problem. Yeah, that that I sense of very divergent perspectives of the same thing that we're seeing is yeah. super interesting. Um, yeah. Dave, I'd love to hear sort of where you get pulled in. If you do, you see this? I because your story was a little bit different. It was a little have the uncovering the hidden knowledge that's out there, but when do you tend to get 
Uh, we, when does somebody tell you they need you and how do they know that they need you? You tend to get pulled in on where people have got what we call intractable problems. Uh, I don't like Again, that, that traction thing. Yeah. Like problems. I think that's just marketing hype. All right. Intractable problems means it's difficult to get a grip on. I think we also get involved where people want solutions at scale. All right. So mm -hmm. if you take, let's take conflict resolution as an example. So I did work on that back in the 70s in Northern Ireland uh, in my Jesuit postulant days, which is a part of my past. All right. And we had two approaches. One was Corimila, which got everybody into a big hall, you know, lots of facilitation, and they all ended up saying they were transformed by the process. Uh, you've got to be really careful in assessing the success of something on asking people before and after because they've come through a process and they're excited. Now, that was wonderfully satisfied in satirized in um, Dairy Girls, which if you haven't seen it, is one of the great British comedies of all time, in which the Catholic girls are forced into a peace and conflict resolution with the Protestant boys, you know, facilitated by a trendy priest watched over by a cynical nun. It's very funny, right? And they end up with a board of everything we've got in common and a board of everything which we've got different. And the common board has got nothing on it. And the different board has got things like Protestants keep their toasters in cupboards and Protestants don't like have it, right? And that's now preserved in the museum in Ulster. We took a different approach. We took asymmetric groups of Protestant and Catholics and we dumped them into Latin America slums for three months in ecumenical projects. And we didn't talk about the troubles. And they found out pretty fast they had more in common than they realized. And they had a conversation about their differences when they were ready to have it in the context of working together. Now, what we're now looking to do, and this is you know, true with the rise of the far right in Germany, stuff in Finland, stuff in the States, is if I take my school children's project, I can look at patterns. I can identify stories which are in common as problems between in the States, say, red and blue. I can then allocate small amounts of money for people from those communities to work on those problems. I don't look at the political differences directly. And it's a key principle of mm. complexity science is you approach problems obliquely, not directly. Yeah? Now, we've done the same thing in organizations. So that's an example of state level actors. The same is true in a company. I mean, we, we measure attitudes. Yeah, attitudes are lead, lead indicators Compliance is a lag indicator. If you can actually measure people's attitudes to things like cybersecurity, you can do actions early, which actually prevent the security problem emerging. And we're doing the same at the moment in ethical use of AI. If you can measure attitudes, you've got a measurement system before it comes around. So those are two examples. The third one, and this is a horrible story, actually. I was at a conference in an agile conference in Eastern Europe two years ago. I was the keynote, female keynote after me. As she walked off the platform, the third keynote slapped her on the bum and said, well done, lass, I'll see you in the bar later tonight. Now, this guy is notorious for it. We, On the circuit, we make sure no women are left alone in a room with him because he's a notorious predator. So I thought we finally got the bastard. So I went to the woman and said, can we do a formal complaint? And she said, no way. Because if I complain about that, what will actually happen is I'll be subject to secondary abuse when I have to confront him. Yeah. And then his friends will gang up on me because, I, you know, you will get him banned and then it will all be my fault. It's not worth it. So we started to talk about that with a few of the big consultancy firms and other things, and they've got the same problem. In that they don't get reports on things like misogynism, fraud, racism until it's so serious that people feel they've got no alternative but to report, and then it's often too late. So again, this comes back to the self-interpretation. We're now allowing people to record that as a microaggression or micro fraud or micro safety concern. We lose the reported data immediately, but we hold the metadata. Then we look for a pattern in the metadata, and that allows us to go to the organization and say, you have got an emerging problem in this area, no, you can't look at the source data. You know, that, that's just not viable. But you need to do something to prevent this problem starting to escalate to the point where you will need whistleblowers. And it's that sort of very early stage weak signal detection, sensing patterns, reducing cost and risk in big programs. That's kind of like where we get called in, where people realize that the sort of hyper-rational, you know, best practice, root cause analysis 
really just doesn't work anymore because they've been down that pathway so many times in the last 30, 40 years. Problems still persist. But it has to be at scale. I want to dig in on tools and I want to dig on in on tools that help scale. Um, Dave, you're, this is your your wheelhouse, your, your favorite place. Yeah, we, we have two, all right? So yeah. uh, first is SenseMaker. Um, that's been used, it's the Oxfam and um, Catholic Relief Services have published a book about all of their various projects. So that's a link to it if anybody wants it. Um, the principle of SenseMaker is that people should have the power to interpret their own story, but you can't ask direct questions. So. I don't buy any social science research which has Likert scales where people know what the right answer should be. Yeah, because they gift or they game. And also it just takes too long to collect. So I'll give you the classic example. Um, if you look at 360 feedback or employee satisfaction, you get a question which says, does your manager consult you on a regular basis, scale of zero, not at all, 10 all the time? And you know exactly what answer is desired. And by the way, I think 360 isn't ethical because you always know who said the negative stories. We take a different approach. We say, what story would you tell your best friend if they were offered in the work, offered a job in your workplace? Then we give them a triangle and it says in this story, the manager's behavior was altruistic, analytical, assertive. So three positive qualities. Yeah. And nobody knows what the, there's a lot of neuroscience behind this, by the way, with six triangles, I get 18 data points. So what I've got is statistical data backed up by narrative. So statistics, numbers are objective, narrative is persuasive, I put the two together. And that's what we do at huge scale. So we don't need facilitation, we don't need secondary interpretation by experts. And there was, I'll give an illustration and do the second method. We did a big project in, on, in Hungary on Roma. So we use Roma kids to gather stories from Roma adults. Nobody had got that data before. We then took stories indexed the same way by Roma and we gave them to the anthropologists responsible for Roma policy in Europe. We asked them to index it. And then we showed them the difference. This, by the way, is a devastating technique. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no expert is interpreting it. You did the same thing. This is the difference. Now, there are three responses to that. One is... Um, okay, we should see it the same way they do. And the answer to that is, well, you can't because you've got different history. The good response is, okay, we see it like that. They see it like this. What does that mean for our policy? That's a good question, yeah? The one we got from the anthropologists was they don't understand their own stories. We're the experts. I've never forgotten that. And that really illustrated, you know, some of the negative attitudes of experts. So that's quanta scale. Yeah, mm -hmm. and we can do that with very large populations through schools and sports clubs. The other one, the newest one we're working with is if you work in the development sector, they can allocate 50 million, but they can't allocate 100 amounts of $1,000. Yeah, they just can't handle it bureaucratically or anything else. But we all know that the smaller amounts would make a bigger difference. And yeah, this is Grameen Bank type functionality. Yeah. Right. So what we're now doing is we know that the one of the basic decision groups for humans in evolutionary history is an extended family. And those groups are never more than seven, the number of active decision makers. So we evolved to compromise in that size of group. So what we end up doing is defining six roles, like the village, this is a Philippines example, the village priest, the head person, the youngest girl still at school, the oldest boy considered to have man head. So you, you go through those rules. And you have one completely anonymous role, so nobody knows who it is. And that's quite deliberate because it creates a panopticon effect and people are more honest. And we yeah, say, yeah. if you can assemble these roles and you agree to do narrative recording in the build up, the decision and afterwards, you can spend a thousand dollars without applying for a grant. And then we look at the patterns of success or failure in all of those and the real money follows the things which are working not the people who are good at applying for grants. And that's an example of genuinely shifting to distributed resource decision, resource making. Yeah. Just in pushing it down. Fascinating. Caitlin, what tool do you like most, use most? And what tool would you like to have? Yeah. So we obviously work with a much on a much smaller scale, right? Yeah. And I think one of the challenges for us is making something 
Um, and also, <laughs> we are bound to only do things digitally for the most part, right? We can't constantly be facilitating. Um, so one of the things that we recently made available, we only launched it about two weeks ago, um, is a, a branch, effectively, of Polis, um, which has been used, um, Antoine might be familiar, um, it's been used with certain citizen assemblies, particularly in South America and also in Taiwan, um, to help support democratic and crowdsourced sentiment analysis, right, um, through the use of variation polling. So we redesigned this to work for a smaller group of people, um, because what we really wanted to optimize for was the ability for people to meaningfully contribute their ideas have a way to meaningfully explore and consider other points of view on the same topic, um, but also to be able to do both of these things without there being a necessary quorum for those things, again, to feel meaningful. Because there could be issues that really, really matter to a small group of contributors, as small as 15 or 20 people. Um, and there could be issues that matter to a thousand. But beyond that, like this is the scale that we are interested in. So what we've done with, we call it Metropolis, um, is it allows people to go and respond to formal governing issues, formal requests for comment, all of these things that are very procedural, those things exist there. Folks can also open up their own polls and questions and they can word them however they'd like. Um, they can be as ambiguous as they'd like, but what we do require is that they feed in um, at least six different responses um, to respond to their initial prompt question or idea. And when anyone else comes in, they are asked to respond across a gradient of feeling really good to feeling not so great. Um, they can drag and drop. There's nothing precise about what we're asking them to do. And they can also uh, respond by posing additional ideas or additional questions. Um, and the idea is that if you're going to have 10 contributors and a million data points that they're willing to give you, um, trying to find where people are more or less comfortable with different ideas and also having an instant feedback mechanism that they can participate in to help explain where we're seeing differences in opinion. Because as we know, and as we've talked about, you know, two people can disagree about the same thing or agree, but it can be for entirely different reasons. And that's really what we want to get into um, is being able to identify those divergences, but also give people a way to understand them themselves um, and work towards finding better solutions. Antoine, what's your favorite tool? Um, the human, humans yes. <laughs> sitting together and um, at best in, a, in the same room, um, in small groups, uh, as Dave, you were saying. Um, because so we know no, from um, many of the civic tech platforms that uh, have a tool for citizen participation online, we know that the, the mean time that people spend on it is 42 seconds. Um, that's the time you invest on a civic tech platform to give your, your feedback, make a proposition. Uh, and 42 seconds is not the, the time you really uh, can make a, a, a good decision, I think, um, that sometimes we need to exchange more arguments. So for me, the, but that's a problem, of course. That's a huge problem because if you take the European Union and what we did with the European Commission, where you have 150 citizens and 480 million inhabitants, uh, of course, you have more chance of winning at the lotto uh, than being selected for such a panel. Uh, so the real question is, how do you scale? Um, and you scale only uh, by demultiplying at different scales uh, and by doing lots of them. And I think, the, but the question is, okay, but you can, you can say, okay, but that's impossible or useless or too costly. And I think for, for that, we need to understand the, the value, which is not only decision-making, but also civic education. And if you look at it, for example, oh, it's, a, for me, a basic uh, infrastructure for governance. If you take the, the European Parliament, it um, has a budget of 4 billion euros a year, so it's 4,000 million. And with that, you can do, uh, I think, almost a thousand of those uh, a year, uh, of citizens' assemblies a year, at European level, and even more at local level. So it's not only a, and, and it's not only a question of decision making, but of the process of, and as uh, John Dewey was putting it, as democracy uh, being not only a decision making process or tool, but also um, a culture and, um, and a way of life. So I think if you, if you zoom out and, and think as um, that kind of processes as being more than just a decision-making tool, then you can talk in a different perspective on how to scale and what to invest into, into that. But I think it's a, it's a huge, um, we, we haven't um, cracked that nut. 
Yeah, that's absolutely key. Okay, we've got 10 minutes left. Um, I would love to hear questions that you guys have. I know that there are some good ones in the chat already, but I feel like the chat's been answering them. So one of them, Artem asked, is, is it true that SenseMaker needs, so the Kinevin tool needs at least a thousand participants or is it at least a th a 300 participants? We have this issue of what's enough scale and what's too much um, participation. Um, Dave, what's your scale when you're using these tools? How many individual people do you think you need to have involved to make it work well? Depends what you're trying to achieve. To be quite honest, it's the same as the sample size criteria in any research. Yeah, if you're working on distributed decision making, you might only have a very small number of people. So, for example, I can gather stories from an employer, from five employees, represent those for interpretation by the manager, so the difference. Mm -hmm. That's not value. So it entirely depends on context. That makes sense. It is. Cool. Yes. Folks, raise your hand if somebody has a question they'd like to pose. I feel like. Michael, you first, and I'll keep an eye on the queue. Sure. I was I was typing to the chat, but I'll just say it now. I guess I'm yeah. I'm interested to hear from our panelists your thoughts or experience on how structure impacts the need for sense making. And if that if you need more clarity clarity, I'm happy to elaborate on my thinking. Any takers? I would need more, but yeah, could you explain what you mean by structure? Do you mean like Okay, so I think in the terms like in an in an organizational context. Um, the way the organization is designed, the way it's set up, the structure, the processes that are in place, the, uh, let's add culture to that. How that, um, how that impacts the, um, maybe the frequency that this tension that, um, Drea mentioned earlier, that, that moment where you realize, okay, we need to stop our normal ways of doing things and do some sense making here out of the normal process. Is that, does anything come up? I'm seeing gentle nodded heads for some people. I, I think in my experience, um, much in the same way, like tools do not define our ability to do something. They, they may enable us, but they can also constrain us in different ways. They are simply tools. Um, I think of a lot of organizational structures or procedures in much the same way. So they can, guide or structure behavior, I think it really depends on the context, how how, how structured the environment is. Um, but it's true that even within really tight codified processes and systems, there's still a ton of space for human divergence from them. Even if people are complying with all of the rules, again, their motivations, their interpretations of these things, um, they can wander. And so I think just from my experience, what I said earlier around you know, when you start people start to see people who um, have a high degree of conflict over things that are relatively non-complex, um, or when you start to see a high degree of motivation, <laughs> but very low degree of traction, um, these are the indicators that um, sense making might be necessary, that there is something that is not being translated appropriately to the group. Um, and again, I think these can happen in really highly structured environments and really low structured environments. Um, it all depends. That's... And when you look like you want to wait, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, it's, I don't know if it's an answer, but actually it's because of the structure I have um, reached a blockage that people try to think about new ways of doing. So it's, my answer would be, of course, the structure is, um, is a condition or is very important because normally it's because the structure doesn't work anymore that people, that people say, okay, hey, we need to think about it. I mean, typical case, again, if I take my last example of the European Commission, uh, before 2016, uh, it was difficult to talk with uh, people from the European Commission bureaucracy about citizens' engagement, uh, and then came Brexit, and then there was a kind of a process, and then starting 17, 18, it was a topic. Um, so what you see is the structure is rather, when it's at the end, it looks for other things. So I, that's rather that. So yes, it's a very important uh, point or very important element. 
I'm going to hop actually to Jonas's question and then wonders, because I think that they are, tie a little bit together. Um, Jonas, I'm going to go ahead and read it out. Let me um, clarify if you'd like, if I get it wrong. Um, the How do we get people to spend more time than 47 seconds? Or, or how do you prevent that sort of anti-sense making for large groups? Um, the people who don't aren't interested in digging in, understanding something, um, coming to agreement in this this uh, time of populism. Yeah, and I'll talk, Dave, actually, we haven't, I'd love to hear sort of how you sort of see that as that mechanism of how do you get people involved oh, in you, something they don't already care about, yeah. You shouldn't make it special. Yeah, you, you shouldn't say, we're gonna get you all together to discuss this issue yeah, we, we've done work, for example, on participatory budgeting, and it ends up people work out pretty fast, making other people's project looks bad, increases their chance of getting funding. Yeah, I mean, anything explicit will be gamed. I mean, our work is to give teachers a pack which will work, to, which will satisfy requirements for the curriculum and get journalists that way or give sports coaches a chance to understand the stories of people playing sports. You, you, you need to make citizen engagement and understanding something which is fully devolved and engaged in the community and nothing special. And that way people become engaged. They're actors, they're not research subjects and they often feel they are or facilitation subjects. So making it part of day-to-day -day business is key. Oh yeah, that is super interesting. Wonder, Harry. yeah. How would you phrase your question in that context? That reputational incentives question. You mean in, in, in a large group or in um in, in kind of a smaller focus setting? That as a as a way of motivating support. Yeah, well, I, I suppose that's the question because I, I think this is a it's a hidden factor in a lot of organizations, just you know, that someone's acquired reputation. Um and so yeah, that's just what I was posing to the, the panel here, just to to find out exactly how they how they view that. Um, that aspect. Um. Yeah, Caitlin, I'm especially curious. I would, my argument here is I think that that we, we have a mechan we have a way of handling reputation and dealing with reputation in smaller organizations. And the, in sort of the political sphere for it's, it's like at the large scale, then reputation turns into who's a celebrity. Um, so, Caitlin, how do you, how has have you dealt with reputation and the influence of, on reputation in these kind of sense, sense making activities of yours? Yeah, the, I mean, to be honest with you, this is a real challenge for us. I think when someone has a really high degree of reputation, um, the more general to it is the reason for that reputation, um, the mm -hmm. harder it is to get people to pause and think that sense making activities um, are important or necessary, right? Um, one of the things that we've done that's a bit more technical um, is for some of our more formal voting within our governance system, we have broken down and created a lot of, of on-chain ways of determining reputation. So one of the things that we mm -hmm. did not want to institute was a single metric for determining weight in a vote, um, which in a lot of organizations is the same thing as reputation, right? Um, so for us, if you're going to vote on a, a public proposal, that's great, but we're going to look at six different metrics of collaboration and engagement, not just one. Um, and it helps to diversify um, sort of the input function of, of reputation in a way that just creates a little bit more diversity. Um, it makes it a little bit more difficult for people to sort of solidify that celebrity status, because I think it can be useful in a lot of ways, but it's a double-edged sword. and and. I don't think we certainly have, it's a human thing that happens. We certainly don't have like a really good solution for preventing some of the challenges associated with it. Fantastic. We are at time and I have an urge to keep talking, but I also want to be respectful of our panelists and our audience and their time. Um, I'm especially sad because Regis just posted a lovely graphic in the chat <laughs> and I wanted to hear some conversation. Um, but here at our break, let's our break. 
Let us thank our panelists very much. If folks want to hang around after, um, they should feel free. But we can also let people go. So thank you very much, Caitlin, Dave, Antoine, for bringing some wisdom. I think you will probably hear uh, lots from these these folks who are in the audience who will follow up with with interesting work, interesting questions. We'd love to stay engaged. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.